often get 20 to 30 mile per hour winds and uh, regularly we, we get gusts of 60 to 75 miles per hour. Hi guys and welcome to the second episode of Should I Get a Wind Generator for My RV? Pros and Cons. So we're, we started out the last one talking about the cons of buying these things from untrusted sellers on Amazon or Alibaba because they, they rate these things in incredible amounts and uh, they don't produce that kind of electricity. Again, you saw the picture, you know that this one was advertised at, at uh, generating 1200 watts. Now if you look right here, this is the unit that I didn't mention that comes with most of them, if not all of them. It's a charge controller. It may or may not look just like this one. They generally come with a charge controller as well. It's got these three green wires on it right here. Um, and that is would be the three wire connection from the wind generator down to uh, your utility area let's call it that your battery area where where you're going to be putting this energy so they'll connect on the three wires from the wind generator will connect there and then you've got a red and a black for your positive and your negative on your wind generator but one thing I want to show you on here is they said it was 1200 watts you can see right here right here hopefully that's close enough 300 watts at 12 volts and even if you used it on a 24 volt system it's still only 600 watts so how's this thing going to put 1200 watts through this it's not it's going to burn it up these things also have an integrated uh, braking system which means once it gets your battery bank up to 14.5 or 29 volts respectively uh, it will basically internally short these wires out and that will cause a load on the generator and, and slow it down you know slow it down so it doesn't overcharge your batteries uh, and then uh, when your batteries get back down to 13.2 volts as read from this red and black wire by this electronic device it will <clears throat> turn that braking off. The braking causes heat in this unit and it causes heat in your wind generator as well which ultimately uh, on the evening in question I believe is what destroyed the, the unit. It destroyed this uh, overheated it and it also overheated the unit inside. These units have a slip ring in them. What the slip ring does is your your PMA, uh, your generator will make the electricity and you know, it runs the two three brushes in here and those brushes ride on three brass rings uh, where there's no direct connection so you don't have wires going from your PMA straight down into your um, battery bank there's a non-physical connection just brushes right in on the, on the brass rings that allow this unit to spin around as much as it wants to without twisting the wires up. If it were a direct connection it would, it would spin around enough where we just turn your wiring in here into a ball and tear it all apart and short it out and ruin everything. So they did have that but the plastic that was uh, molded that the brass rings were molded on uh, as an insulator, an isolator, uh, wasn't a high heat plastic. So when this thing got hot, when it was producing over uh, the 300 watts, uh, it melted down and lost connection and then it quit producing power. And then this, this thing was up here spinning uh, freewheel. And one of the things about these things freewheeling, freewheeling is that you will get to a point uh, with really strong winds is that the tip of these blades is moving so fast that it will tear them off. The wind generator will self-destruct because these blades are spinning so fast there's nothing to slow it down. Luckily that didn't happen but it did overheat the inside so much that you can see still the residue of oil from the bearing in here that got so hot that the, the grease turned into uh, water and just ran out of the bearing and uh, there's also some residue on this bearing here. Uh, 
have, which will take us into actually construction of these. This bearing in the front is really cheap. A lot of better wind generators have a bearing in the back to hold the back. This one doesn't, it just has the one in the front and it really quickly wears out um, and causes the, the whole assembly to be loose and floppy and noisy. construction, overrated systems. Next thing I want to talk about is the blades themselves. When I talk about loose and sloppy on the bearings, um, a lot of times there will be a very big disparity between the blade uh, weights. And when the blades are not, when they don't weigh the same, uh, it causes the unit to be out of balance and again it wears that bearing out quickly. Now I weighed these after this unit was destroyed because I'm planning on rebuilding it. And these particular blades that I have are actually really close in tolerance. I've got four at 279 grams, and then I've got an oddball here at 276 grams, which those three grams, I could maybe put an extra washer or two on this blade to, to balance it out to get those other three grams there. Uh, but I weighed those on a little kitchen cooking digital scale and that's what I ended up getting with this thing. I found that this tail was too short uh, and small to keep the wind generator facing into the wind um, and so I think they call it centripetal force uh, but as the blades spin, the faster they spin they want to turn the, the windmill out of the wind. Uh, kind of a gyroscopic type of thing. So I added this big, big aluminum plate onto the tail fan. So it was kicking out of the wind at maybe 25, 30 miles per hour. So that wasn't benefiting me. Um, but ultimately, I think adding that on actually just forced the system to do what they said it would do, uh, spec-wise, and it couldn't handle it at all. So <clears throat> you have poor construction, Poor design, um, low quality control. Um, you have no way uh, with a lot of these. They'll uh, they put these up for sale and they'll they'll put some crazy kind of wattage on it and that I fell for. You'll buy it and then in six months or, or less, maybe six weeks, that seller will be gone. And by the time you really do your research on how much energy this thing is making, there's, there's no place to send it back to. They're gone. Um, so, um, you know, good luck with that. Buyer beware, once again. So those are some cons of this thing. Let's, uh, let's talk about one more, one more con, uh, and that is when these things are really blowing around, when they're really going, we've got to assume that, especially if you're mobile, that you're going to have this probably mounted in some kind of situation and uh, on your RV. And what would seem to be the most logical place to mount one of these wind generators would be on your ladder. You can kind of run your pole up and, and attach it to your ladder. Maybe it's based on the ground but it's sticking up above the RV and it will spin around up there. And because this is such, you know, it's a pretty big circumference. Uh, one and a half meters is about, what, five feet? So you basically, when the, when the wind is catching these blades and spinning them around, it's, it gets to a point where it's like a solid, uh, solid panel, solid s circle. Um, and that's a lot of force on your ladder. 
I would expect that if you got into a, a high wind situation and you weren't able to shut this thing down, it would tear, tear the uh, ladder off of your RV. Now maybe you could put it on a tripod, um, you would have to have a pretty uh, heavy base and, and wide legs on the bottom to keep it from blowing over because this the wind does put a lot of force on this. If you can imagine holding a five foot diameter piece of wood in, in a 20 or 30 mile an hour wind, um, that's how much force is, it's putting on this, on, on whatever you got it attached to. And that leads you to the safety concern of what are you going to do with it when it's spinning that fast? You, know, you just got to kind of let it go and, and do whatever it's going to do and hope it doesn't destroy itself and the RV and, and, and everything else. You know, you're going to get up there and, and try to stop those blades. It's it, you're sticking your hand in a Cuisinart. Um, there's, you just got to ride it out at that point. Um, so those are the cons. That's a lot of a lot of cons to make people people think. Well, maybe I shouldn't get one of those. Here's the pros. Um, it. They're inexpensive, relatively. Um, secondly, they're, they produce electricity at night. And I still, even though this one went bad, I still, when the wind blows at night, it's like, I'm making electricity. So, so that's good. That's good. You know, it's, it's, it's not a lot, but it is some. Um, you know, you might be able to get 50 in a 10, 15 mile per hour breeze. You might be able to get 50 watts, 75 watts, um, and, and that's something. You know, it's something if you don't use a lot of electricity, if you're really uh, you know, uh, uh, electrically frugal when you're dry camping and boondocking, then This could potentially keep your batteries charged up at night if there's a good breeze. Um, and on really cloudy days, um, you know, it's, it's a benefit to have some energy coming in when your solar panels, uh, you know, are not doing much for you. Um, and a lot of times when it's cloudy and stormy, then you've got winds with that. So it can offset some, some loss from solar panels if you're boondocking. Um, those are the pros that I can think of. I really can't think of any other pros of this thing. And in my mind, to kind of wrap this video up, I would say that in most situations, um, you're better off just to put another solar panel on your roof um, than you are to have a wind generator stored somewhere in the RV and then you've got to, you've got to mount it and, and do assembly when you stop and, and charge batteries and, and things like that. So it seems to me like a better option just to put another panel or two on your RV and maybe increase the size of your battery bank uh, where you're not as concerned about genera generating electricity at night. Uh, but I'll leave it up to you. What do you guys think about wind generators? Do you have one or have you ever used one on an RV? And, and what was your experience with it? Put that in the comment section down below. Again, if you guys got any questions, comments, or concerns, also put that down in the comments below. I appreciate you watching, and I will, of course, end with, please subscribe, like the videos, ring the bell, share the videos in social media and other places you can, websites, forums. Uh, if, if you found them useful and uh, you think they would be useful to other people, then I've done my job. And until next time, thanks for watching. And let's, let me take this moment to
take you over to where I have the wind generator equipment set up. It's, it's, it looks kind of hokey because it's, it's a temporary setup as I'm building uh, the studio slash shop garage here uh, on the homestead. Um, but I will show you what I'm talking about as far as uh, electrical generation and as far, far as uh, how I've set the system up. I want to show you this. Right now my solar has got my batteries. My 24 volt system at 29.6. There's no wind blowing and if there was wind blowing, if there was wind blowing uh, enough to break that 29, to go over 29.6 volts on the wind generator, then this would start showing wattage and milliamps. But you can see right here that I have with this windmill that's on the roof, I have generated 34.98 thousand watts. That's, n that's not nothing. Once it starts producing any kind of braking voltage, then it will start timing up um, and counting the seconds. So right now we've got um, 870, like I said, 879 hours. That said, we can look over here and I just put this in. Um, this has got eight solar panels on it. It has produced 431,000 hours uh, in about four months. 431,000 hours compared to 36,000 hours. It's kind of a no-brainer that if you're wanting to produce power for an off-grid situation, you want to go with solar as much as you can.